Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Please get cozy as we jump right into these Bigfoot and paranormal encounters. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and ding that notification bell. I post new videos every single day, and you'll be notified when they go live. Okay, let's get into it. I'd always been a bit of a hippie at heart, but lately, I noticed how attached I'd become to modern conveniences. The constant noise, the screens, the never-ending rush of life. It was suffocating. So I made a decision. I would head into the woods, just me and a good book, and find solace in the peace and quiet of nature. The sun setting as I arrived at the secluded campsite, deep within the forest. The air was crisp and the scent of pine filled my nostrils. It felt like a sanctuary, away from the chaos of the world. As I set up my tent and started a small fire, I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement mixed with unease. Night fell and darkness enveloped the woods. The crackling fire provided me with some comfort as I nestled into my sleeping bag. But as I lay there, listening to the sounds of the forest, an unsettling feeling began to creep over me. Snap! My heart skipped a beat as I heard a twig break nearby. I tried to convince myself it was just an animal passing through. But my imagination began to run wild. Every rustle of leaves and distant hoot of an owl seemed amplified in the stillness of the night. I closed my eyes and tried to focus on breathing, attempting to catch my racing mind, but every little sound seemed to send shivers down my spine. Was it just my imagination playing tricks on me, or was there something out there? The wind picked up, causing the trees to sway and creak ominously. Shadows danced around me, casting eerie shapes on the tent walls. My heart pounded in my chest as I fought against the rising panic within me. Then I heard it. A low, guttural growl. My blood turned to ice as I realized it was not the sound of any animal I'd ever encountered before. Fear gripped me, paralyzing my body and mind. I strained my ears, trying to locate the source of the sound. Was it getting closer? I held my breath, hoping that remaining still would make me invisible to whatever lurked in the darkness. Suddenly, a branch snapped just outside my tent. My heart leapt into my throat as I clutched my book tightly, ready to defend myself if necessary. The air grew heavy with anticipation as I waited for the unknown to reveal itself. Minutes felt like hours as the forest held its breath. Then, without warning, a loud thud echoed through the night. It was as if something massive had landed on the forest floor. My mind raced, conjuring images of monstrous creatures lurking just beyond the reach of my feeble firelight. Fear consumed me, but curiosity pushed me forward. Slowly and silently, I unzipped the tent and peered outside. The moon cast an eerie glow over the clearing, revealing a sight that sent chills down my spine. There, standing in the shadows, was a figure, a tall and hulking silhouette that seemed to blend seamlessly with the darkness. Its eyes glowed with an otherworldly intensity as it stared hungrily. I hesitated for a moment, frozen in fear, as the creature stepped into the moonlight. It was unmistakably a Bigfoot, towering over everything in its path. Its massive frame was covered in matted dark fur that seemed to absorb the light around it. The sight of its sharp yellow teeth sent a shiver down my spine. My heart pounded in my chest as I slowly zipped the tent back up, trying to stifle the sound as best I could. 
I clamped my hands over my mouth, desperately praying that the Bigfoot wouldn't hear me. Tears streamed on my face as I trembled beneath my sleeping bag, unable to control the terror coursing through my veins. The Bigfoot hooted several times, its deep guttural calls reverberating through the night. Each hoot felt like a warning, a reminder of just how vulnerable and insignificant I was in its presence. I could feel the weight of its gaze upon me, even from within the safety of my tent. Time seemed to stand still as I waited, my mind racing with thoughts of what this creature might do next. Would it tear through my tent? Would it come after me? The uncertainty was unbearable, and I could feel every nerve in my body screaming for escape. The Bigfoot moved closer to my campsite, its massive feet thudding against the forest floor. My heart threatened to burst from my chest as I prayed with every fiber of my being that it would ignore me and focus on something else. With a mixture of relief and horror, I watched as the creature approached the cooler that sat just five feet away from my tent. Its primal instincts took over as it rummaged through the contents, searching for something to satisfy its hunger. The sound of cans being crushed and food being devoured filled the air. Drowning out everything else, I remained motionless, too terrified to even breathe. The tears continued to flow down my face, a silent testament to the overwhelming fear that consumed me. I felt utterly helpless at the mercy of this monstrous being that had invaded my peaceful retreat. After what felt like an eternity, the Bigfoot finished its feast and lumbered away into the darkness, leaving me trembling and alone. I stayed in my tent, paralyzed by the trauma of what I had just witnessed. The night seemed never-ending as I clung to the hope that dawn would bring safety and relief. I ran back to my car, which was quite the trek away, but adrenaline made me fly through the trail. As soon as I got home, exhaustion took over me, and I drifted into a fitful sleep. But even in my dreams, the image of Bigfoot haunted me, a constant reminder of the terror that lurked just beyond the veil of civilization, and civilization is exactly where I will stay. On to the next one. I am very excited to announce that on this channel, we are offering membership. Now, I never want my subscribers to feel like I am paywalling content, so new videos will remain 100% completely free. The membership is a way for those who feel like they want to support me to do so and help the channel grow monetarily. What your membership gives you access, though, to are subscriber badges, which evolve with how long you've been a member, and you can watch your badge grow from a baby Bigfoot all the way up to a sage Bigfoot. Also, as a member, you'll get access to member-only emojis, which are these beautiful Bigfoot emojis. Again, I never want to paywall any content on this channel. I always want the content to be free because I love the community and I want you to enjoy your time here. But if you do wish to support me making this content, this membership is a way for you to do that. Thanks for listening and on to the next one. Jack Harris was driving on the only road leading into the Lake Worth Nature Center when he spotted a Bigfoot crossing the road in front of him. The man-beast ran up and down a bluff and was soon being watched by 30 to 40 people who had come to the area to see it after the Fort Worth Star-Telegram headlined a story entitled Fishy Man Terrifies Couple Parked at Lake Worth. Within a short time, sheriff's officers were also there and observed the same creature. When it appeared that the onlookers were getting too close to the creature, it fired a spare tire complete with the rim at them, and they jumped back into their cars. The seven-foot-tall hairy humanoid weighed 300 pounds, 
walked on two feet, and had whitish gray hair. It also made a pitiful cry like something was hurting it. It was seen to throw the tire and rim more than 500 feet. The creature was high up on a bluff and apparently annoyed by the carloads of witnesses who were looking at it. This was in Lake Worth, Tarrant County in Texas. On to the next one. A 14-year-old boy was in an area only accessible by water on the Brazos River near Mineral Wells in Palo Pinto County in Texas. He was one of a party of 20 campers and two counselors on a three-day, two-night canoe and camping trip down the Brazos River. They put in just below the dam at Possum Kingdom Lake. As they were setting up camp, some of the campers spotted some type of unknown animal peering down at them from atop a 30-foot cliff. No one thought much about it. The next morning, the boy's canoe and tent buddy told him that he had seen the animal. The first boy knew a way to get up the cliff face, and they were on top in no time, and could hear something running off through the woods. They immediately gave chase, and the first boy was in the lead. There were some large boulders lying around, and he ran around one of the larger ones, but as he ran around it, he ran smack into another large tree which knocked him back flat on his rump. He was crumpled at the base of the tree and dazed. When his eyes focused again, he noticed that the tree had hair. He looked up, the creature screamed, and the boy literally peed in his pants. The friend screamed, it screamed, the boy screamed. It screamed again, and all of this in quick and distorted time. The boys were in a blind panic and ran right off the edge of the cliff. The boys said that they had run into a giant gorilla. Everybody thought that they were crazy and had made it all up. When the boys ran into it, he only saw from the waist down and it was covered in dark, almost black hair. On to the next one. On Greer Island in Lake Worth in Tarrant County in Texas, several witnesses saw a swimming gorilla-like creature that was seen in the lake. Parties of searchers, many carrying guns, descended onto the lake area around Lake Worth, usually at night, and many stated that the man-beast resembled a big white ape. Tracks were also found that were 16 inches long and 8 inches wide at the toes. On one occasion, searchers fired on the beast and insisted that they followed a trail of blood and tracks to the edge of the water. On another occasion, three men insisted that the creature leapt into and jumped off only after the car collided with a tree. Other witnesses stated that they heard the beast and also smelled it, as it was associated with a foul odor. On to the next one. Near the South Sulphur River, near Commerce in White Hunt County in Texas, Jerry Matlock, Kenneth Wilson, and others saw an eight-foot-tall, hairy, brown-haired Bigfoot with wide shoulders that suddenly came fast over a levee toward their car at night. The men drove away while unsuccessfully trying to fire a gun at the creature. On to the next one. At Lake Worth in Tarrant County in Texas, at 2 a.m., Charles Bunchnan was sleeping in the back of his pickup truck when he suddenly awoke to see a tall, hairy humanoid towering over him. The man be seemed to be a cross between a human and a gorilla. The creature jerked Charles to the ground, who was still in his sleeping bag and gagged from the stench of the beast. Charles, in his desperation, grabbed a bag of leftover chicken 
and shoved it into the creature's face. The creature grabbed the bag from him, and with its long arms, it took the sack into its mouth and made some guttural noises and then loped off through the trees, went into the water, and swam toward Greer Island with powerful strokes. On to the next one. At Lake Somerville in Burleson County in Texas, I observed a strange howling scream, a foul stench shortly after moon set. The lake wind had died down and the night was calm. Our dogs started getting nervous and ran whimpering under the car. A few minutes later, the air filled with the most god-awful stench like that of rotten meat, only mustier. I remember my mother saying, what the heck is that smell? And my brother sat up in his cot. When he sat up is when all of us heard the scream. My family and myself have spent many hours in the Texas woodlands, and I know most of the sounds native animals make. I have never heard anything like that in my life. Even thinking about it now, some 24 years later, it still makes me shiver and break out in goosebumps. As I have stated, I know most of the animal sounds in the state. I can tell you that it was not a bobcat, panther, cougar, javelina, screech owl, or anything else I can think of. I've only heard one thing that even comes close, and that's the audio tape of Sasquatch. And, as I said, it was close. The scream started out as a low, growling sound that ended in a shrill scream. It was loud. I mean, incredibly loud. I shot one round from my gun into the air, and whatever it was went away, or so he thought. By now, we had built a roaring fire, but this did not stop it. It came back eight times before daybreak. It was not afraid of us, nor the fire. Only the sound of the gunfire would drive it off. All shots were fired in the air because, quite frankly, we could not find a target to shoot at. As soon as it got light enough, we went looking for track, a path through the grass, something, anything. There were plenty of tracks from raccoons, possums, the dog, ourselves, mice and birds, but nothing unusual. The only thing we found was a small stand of saplings with their tops broken at about five and a half feet above ground, about 200 yards away east of our camp. I mention this because these saplings had that same horrible stench, only not nearly as strong. The second night we were there, the full moon had set about 3 a.m. Earlier that night, I had moved our garbage can up the road after dinner to keep the raccoons from keeping us up all night. It was midsummer, hot and very dry. We had our lean-to pitched between two live oak trees in a tall grass field that sloped down to the lake shore. There had not been any rain in that area for some time, so that most of the grass had dried out. Dry grass cuts down on ticks and other insects, there was about an eighth inch of dust over the hard tack in the exposed area. There was also a small pond about 40 yards down the slope between our campsite and the lake shore. This, I believe, had once been a stock tank. The open end of the lean-to was facing the lake shore so as to get the breeze from the lake. The other end faced a dirt road that was about 300 yards upgrade. On to the next one. Kathiana Eagle was with her family when they took her 1999 quad cap pickup hunting near St. Anthony, Idaho one day. They shot three elk and brought them home. They spent the next few hours and days gutting them out and hanging them to bleed. They had mostly cleaned the pickup but there was still some blood in the back of the truck they hadn't washed out yet. The next day, they were above Bannock Creek with the same truck. 
They were gone all day, coming home late at night, with three dogs sitting in the back seat. All of a sudden, the truck started losing power, and the RPMs went way up. About that time, Eagle felt something hit the back of the truck. The dogs jumped over the seat onto the floor of the passenger side of the truck, she said. It was pitch black outside, and I couldn't see him, but I knew he, the Bigfoot, was there. He stayed there about a quarter to a half a mile until we hit the Arban Valley Road, and then I felt him jump out of the back. Immediately, the RPMs went back down and the dogs relaxed. I was freaking out. It was scary, Eagle said. I flew down the road to Bannock Creek. When I stopped later, we took a good look at the back of the truck. She and her husband found a clear hand and footprint in the truck and could see where the Bigfoot had licked the blood out of the grooves in the truck bed. I took pictures of it all, but the pictures never developed, she said. That seems to happen with pictures of the Bigfoot. Eagle's job involved delivering newspapers in the middle of the night to drop locations from where they will be delivered to customers the following day. On one particular day, she was coming home as the sun was coming up. She clearly saw a Bigfoot sitting about a hundred feet off the road. He had his foot crossed over his other leg and he was picking something out of his foot. I can still see it in my mind's eye as he spread his toes apart, she said. He was dark brown with a reddish tinge and he had this head tilted at an angle so I couldn't see his face. He was just pulling something out of his foot like we might do when we are walking around barefoot. She often sees the Bigfoot on the way home in the early morning light. Three different times she has seen him on Siphon Road in the dip just before it meets up with the freeway. The last time I saw him there, he was standing along the side of the road, she said. There was a bush there, and he was apparently trying to blend in. I got a good look at him as he stepped over the guardrail heading north. It was just a short glimpse, but he looked pretty beat up. On to the next one. Danielle Danny Eldridge grew up on the Shoshone-Bannock Indian Reservation, where they moved around a lot. About the time she was in the third grade, her family moved to a home on Gay Main Road near Mount Putnam. I was sitting outside on the front porch with the rest of the kids when I heard what sounded like a huge pack of dogs fighting, she said. It sounded awful. Then we heard a screaming yell like a dog was being ripped in half. The sound echoed off the hillside. It was enough to make a huge impression on her. She never forgot what she heard. Years later, she was once again living on the reservation when she had another odd experience. It was late at night, and her children were all in bed when she happened to glance out the back window where there was a big bush in her yard. I realized there was something wrong with what I was seeing. Then I recognized there was something there that shouldn't have been there. It looked like a big bush, except I don't have a bush in my yard, she said. Then it stood up. It was huge, black, and very fast. She immediately decided it would be a good idea to shut the window and the blind. She was attempting to do that when the Bigfoot began to run around her trailer. It sounded like a huge Clydesdale horse thundering around the trailer, she said. It was pounding on all the sides of the trailer. Standing up, it was almost taller than the trailer. I can't even begin to express how terrified I was. It moved so fast that she thought it must have some type of mystical power. By then, her children were up and in the living room when she joined them and the family dog a pit bull. He was shaking, she said. A short time later, the Bigfoot left, and she did too, packing some bags and taking her children with what they could grab quickly. She went somewhere she thought might be safer. 
That week, she moved away from that house. I wasn't about to go back to that house, she said. I figured the Bigfoot could have it if he wanted it. On to the next one. Adrian Jody Edmo took his wife to camp near Mount Putnam a few years ago and had what some would think was an enviable experience. Edmo stayed near a family of Bigfoot. There was an older male and a female and three juveniles, and he was able to see them and watch them for half an hour at a time. We were up by Mount Putnam near Five Points for nearly three months in the fall, said Edmo. We ran into an entire Bigfoot family. We learned to tell them apart and which one was which when we recognized their footprints. There was one Bigfoot making a 22-inch footprint, another which made an 18-inch footprint, while a smaller one possessed an 8-inch footprint. Two other sets of footprints were jumbled together. The Edmo family saw the Bigfoot family regularly, and would frequently interact with them and leave them gifts. We would leave them deer and elk meat, and occasionally potatoes, fish, or wild berries, Edmo said. We would also play music for them. He said the Bigfoot were all brown and black like an elk, but with a silvery sheen to their hair, especially when it was wet. It was rather pretty. Edmo called the biggest one Old Man as he was obviously older than the others, and one day the old man Bigfoot came all the way up to where Edmo had parked his pickup near their camp. Edmo said his family would go up and camp in the same area each time they went to the mountains. They would usually stay until they became uncomfortable, ran out of supplies, or felt the need to leave. Then they would move their camp downhill. The Bigfoot would follow us down the hill, he said. They startled the horses, but they would come in and take the meat and corn I would leave for them. He said when his grandson and nephew would come with him to hunt, they would always leave the Bigfoot the heart, liver, and kidneys of their kill. While this experience seems fanciful, Edmo said the Bigfoot had been up there as long as he has been going up there all of his 72 years. They've been there since I was a child. They don't scare me. I would ride all of the old horse trails all over, Edmo said. They'd come by us at our feedlot on the reservation in the spring and the fall as they traveled back to Mount Putnam across the reservation. A lot of people see them, but we don't bother them, while the Bigfoot he has seen usually have brown eyes. The ones with the red eyes can't be trusted. They are more aggressive, he says. They eat more meat than the others. The peaceful ones usually have brown eyes. Some of them are not as hairy as others. A couple of them have longer claws on their feet. They are a little scary, he said. Edmo said he has always said prayers to them as the Bigfoot have their own medicine. He has also seen the Bigfoot disappear right in front of people. We just go about our business, he said. The Bigfoot often comes down to the sundown ceremony and people will often see them afterward. They are good, strong medicine, he said. They have trails all over the bottoms, where we call the government meadow. Edmo also related a story of the time when a Bigfoot was killed near Mount Putnam back when he was a kid. It was over 40 years ago. Some children were fooling around and coming down Ross Fork Road too fast when they hit a baby Bigfoot, he said. They told the tribal fish and game who went to check it out. They found the body and wrapped it in a blanket. Later, they dug a hole near where it was hit and buried it. The medicine man said a lot of prayers. Edmo said that the grave is down near the bottom of the valley by Mount Putnam. No one bothers it as they respect the Bigfoot too much. On to the next one. A Marshall County mail carrier claimed she saw Bigfoot in the spring of 1990 while she was attempting to deliver a package to a resident on Cole Cemetery Road in Benton, Kentucky. It was early afternoon on a pleasant day. She was 30 years old and eight months pregnant. 
in April 1990. I was attempting to make a residential delivery, she said. While walking up the gravel drive, I noticed a flock of birds flying overhead coming from the direction of a thick grouping of trees in the back of a field to my left. They were chattering loudly and flying wildly in what seemed to be a race. As they got closer, I noticed that they were different species flying together, blue jays, cardinals, blackbirds, finches. This struck me as odd for a moment. When I reached the steps to the porch of the home, I heard the thunder of hooves hitting the ground and turned and saw many horses that were in the field come running from the edge of the forest toward the house. They too were whinnying and making a lot of commotion. Before I could really think anything about it, I saw several deer leaping from the thick trees and running through the fields away from the same spot and behind the horses. My first thought then was that there was a fire. I hurried to the residence's door and knocked very hard and repeatedly while scanning the sky for any signs of smoke. No one answered. Having delivered here before, I thought the occupant might be around back in the barn, so I left the porch and turned to walk in that direction. According to her, that's when she heard the most terrifying sound that she's ever heard in her entire life. I knew it could not have been human or from any known animal in this area, she stated. The terrifying sound had come from a thick group of trees and echoed over the field. It was a mixture of a deep lion's growl that heightened into a scream containing the same low, deep, loud rhythm. I stood stunned, half scared and half curious, from the area where the sound had traveled from, she could now see a large figure shaking the tree. It was something very tall, she recalled, very large in width and very strong looking, as some of the smaller pine trees about 10 to 15 feet in height were being shaken back and forth vigorously and violently. The figure itself was not totally visible, but hidden mostly behind the shadows of the larger trees behind and around it. It was dark in color, dark brown or black, with a thick furry outline. It looked to have stood well over seven feet in height. It began moving along the edge of the tree toward the house, just keeping inside the safety of the shadows. The horses in the pasture were on the far right-hand side now, rising up and hitting the fence with their hooves. This was too much excitement for me and I turned to run to my truck. That hideous sound came through the air again, but this time it was much closer than before. I quickly made it into the truck, started the engine, and left very rapidly, halfway expecting the engine to be flooded or the battery dead, like in some lame horror movie. The event left her pretty shaken, but unfortunately it was also her duty as a courier to return to the home the next day to re-attempt the delivery. Upon reaching the residence, she briefly explained to the occupant what occurred the day before, expecting him to laugh at her story. To my surprise, he only agreed that there had been some strange sound coming from that neck of the woods lately, and that his horses were frequently spooked by something in the area. He also stated that a friend of his had took his hunting dog back there a few weeks prior to this incident, and that the dog took out after something, disappeared from sight, let out curdling yelping sounds, then went quiet. He said his buddy found what was left of the dog, its head was not to be found, and that there had been a foul odor around the area at the time. He further insisted it was probably a bobcat or something, and never suggested anything else except not to go in them there woods by myself. Not to worry, I had no intentions of it. The sighting only lasted from 20 to 30 seconds, she later said, with the mysterious figure remaining about 100 feet away in the shadow, just out of full view. She couldn't see any facial features, but felt that the creature, whatever it was, was staring at her. As she stared at the thing, she got goosebumps. The hair on the back of her neck stood up, and her legs trembled with fear. According to her, 
The animal was eight feet to nine feet tall at least, and was from three to four feet wide. It was covered with dark colored hair that was darker than the tree trunk. It moved slowly and deliberately, cautiously taking a few steps and then pausing, and then a few more steps before pausing again. The witness claimed that she watched the beast take about eight to ten steps in this fashion before she left the area. Land between the lakes is located about 20 miles from the site of the encounter. Bigfoot made an appearance in Martin County one summer afternoon way back in 1950, deep in the mountains of Warfield, Kentucky. After the witness had seen the creature, she was told not to tell anyone about it because they would surely think that she was crazy. It only took 53 years for her to overcome the fear of public ridicule and tell her story. In 1950, when I was 12 years old, I lived in a little hamlet called Beauty, located in eastern Kentucky, along the border of the Tug River. We children played in the mountains almost all summer long. We had heard of a rock cliff back up on the hill that had a cave in it, and we decided to go looking for this cliff with the cave. Being kids, we didn't keep track of how far we climbed or what ridges we went on. But finally, we reached this cliff. We were standing at the base, looking up through the shadows of the tree, when I noticed there was someone standing up on the rock about ten feet up looking back at us. He was, I judged, about six feet tall, muscular. His arms were longer than a human, his legs about like a human. He had hair much like a chimp's hair grows on its arms and legs, not the fuzzy hair like a bear. His chest seemed to be pretty hairless, very hairy around the genital area, so no one could tell if he was male or female. But I didn't see any breast, so I judged it to be a male. He was holding a heavy stick in his hand as he stood there, looking down at us. I could not see his facial features. I would say that he was an intelligent being from the way he behaved. He stood looking at us for about 15 seconds, then he stepped back out of sight and was gone. It was not until I was an adult that I realized what I had seen. I believe this being knew we were children. I believe he allowed us to see him because we did not present him any danger. Of course, we yelled and tore up the bushes running back off that hill. I told my grandma that we had seen a gorilla, and she told me people would think I was crazy, so I kept it to myself what I had seen. The sighting occurred in the early afternoon with good viewing condition. The witness didn't realize just what it was she saw until she was an adult. On May 24, 2006, in Inez, Kentucky, the county seat, four campers, were able to observe a gigantic, hair-covered creature for over 10 minutes. It was around 3 a.m. when me and a few of my male companions were gathered around a campfire. One of my friends had passed out due to drinking, and we had carried him inside of the tent. Several hours later, we heard groaning sounds coming from the direction of the tent. We thought nothing of it. Little did we know, something had been watching us. The groaning went on for hours until we finally checked our drunk friend. He was silent, and the groaning continued. I peered behind the tent direction. I thought the sounds were coming from, and there was, about 15 feet from us, what appeared to be an ape-like creature sleeping. It was rolling around as if it were trying to find a spot to get comfortable. I was quiet for several minutes. Then I called to one of my friends to check this thing out. He came to see what the fuss was about, and when he saw the creature, he screamed in fear. The creature raised its head, looking startled. It rose from the ground. It appeared to be about seven or eight feet tall. The monster took off in a hurry, according to the witness. It was somewhere between seven and eight feet tall, he said, brownish hair that appeared to be about two to three inches thick around its body. I couldn't see very much in detail. These are the only facts I can give from what I've seen. Two more Martin County campers were surprised on the night of February 17, 2006. 
My wife and I were camping in the woods, said JT, as we were falling asleep. I heard a rustling noise outside the tent. I wanted to go outside to check to see if we had put our food away so as to not attract bears. As I went outside, I turned my flashlight on so I could see what I was doing. When I did this, I saw something step into the wood. The witness, badly frightened, dropped his flashlight and ran back into the tent, leaving the hot dog buns and cheese where they lay on the table. As he climbed back into the tent, he looked back to see the creature as it fled back into the woods, screeching and grunting. According to him, the creature was at least seven to seven and a half feet tall, grotesquely hairy, and possibly wet. The very next month, on March 11, 2007, a seven or eight foot tall, hair covered creature with long teeth reportedly scared two children as they waited for the school bus in Milo, Kentucky. My sister and I were waiting for the bus, claims Jay Waller, when something started throwing rocks at us. He figured they were the object of some of his friends' pranks until they heard a growling noise coming from some nearby trees. Bravely, he went to see what it was, then spied the huge monster, which, according to Waller, struck at him, causing him to flee in panic. Martin County, another extreme eastern Kentucky county, has a population around 13,000 residents. A rather well-publicized Mason County Bigfoot account appeared in the Chicago Sun-Times, 10-12-80 edition, and concerned a Mr. Charles Fulton and family who claimed that while watching television one night of October 4th, they heard a commotion out on the front porch, apparently involving one of Fulton's roosters. When he looked out, sure enough, there was the rooster in the hand of a seven-foot-tall, 400-pound man-like creature with long white hair and, by some account, glowing pink eyes. Upon being seen, it threw the rooster against the side of the house and headed around back. Bolton grabbed a twenty-two pistol and promptly gave chase, despite the bizarre appearance of the intruder. He was able, he later claimed, to investigate, to fire on the creature twice, to no effect, as the monster made its escape in a slow-motion kind of run. Exhibiting large strides, but strangely moving at low speeds, he felt sure that he could catch up to it, but, even more strangely, the faster Fulton ran, the further away the creature appeared. It was like a dream, he said. The Chicago Sun-Times ran the following article about the encounter in Sunday, October 12, 1980 edition. One look at Bigfoot is enough. Maysville, Kentucky, UPI, Anna Mae Sanders, still awed by the sight of a Bigfoot, says she doesn't want another look at the seven-foot creature covered with long white hair. She is certain she saw it last weekend outside the home of her son-in-laws in rural Mason County. I just hope that that thing doesn't come back, said Sanders, 60. I never saw anything like it in my life. It just looked like a big white fuzzy thing standing there on the porch. I never saw its face. It was above the seven-foot high door, she added. Saunders' son-in-law, Charles Fulton, said the creature had one of his roosters when he opened the door, but either dropped it or threw it as it jumped off the porch. He described the so-called Bigfoot as having long white hair with glowing animal-like eyes. Fulton, 39, went outside and saw it standing between the house and an outbuilding. He fired two shots with a twenty two caliber pistol, but they seemed to have no effect. It loped off at a slow motion, kind of a gallop, he said. Fulton and his family were at their rural home in a heavily wooded area watching television Saturday night when one of the children came into the living room and said someone was turning the back door knob. Thinking the child was joking, Fulton made him sit and watch television. A few minutes later, something like to have torn my front door off, Fulton said. He said he did not tell authorities about the sighting because he feared no one would believe him. Saunders and the three children said they also saw the creature from inside the house. Fulton discounted the possibility that the creature was a bear because of its upright position and said 
It definitely was not a man in a costume. Saunders, who lives in a mobile home near the Fulton home, said, I'm scared to death to stay by myself now. Whenever I go back to the trailer, I look in all directions. She said there had been similar sightings recently in Aberdeen, Ohio, just across the Ohio River from Mason County. When later contacted by two Bigfoot investigators, Fulton further addressed that the thing's hair was real long, like a horse's mane. He stated that the thing was manlike, except those eyes were like that of an animal. It was a strange experience for him, especially the way the thing ran with the long, slow stride, like in slow motion. He felt like he should have been easily able to catch up to it, but the faster he ran, the further the distance between himself and the creature began. Almost like a dream, he said, the kind of dream like when a wild animal is chasing you and you can't seem to run away. Thankfully, the rooster escaped with no serious injuries. On October 10th, a woman claimed that she'd been chased to her car by a hairy man-like creature as she was leaving the central shopping center in Maysville. The creature put in another appearance in Maysville only a couple weeks later on November 5th. According to a report on file with the Maysville, Kentucky Police Department, around 4 or 5 a.m. that morning, a truck driving one Mr. N. Clay was hauling steel just west of Maysville on U.S. Route 68 when he saw what he at first thought was a hitchhiker. On slowing down, he was shocked to see a six to seven foot tall ape-like creature with white hair. All notions of good Samaritanism were immediately crushed, of course. The police stated they believed Clay was serious about what he had reported. In 2007, Jeremiah H. claimed that he'd had a couple different run-ins with a Bigfoot-type creature in Maysville, Kentucky, back in late 2002 and early 2003. Both incidents involved multiple witness sightings of these strange creatures. The first encounter I had, Jeremiah stated, I left my house around 10.30 p.m. to go pick up a friend from his house in Germantown. I was traveling north with three other friends in the vehicle on the Clyde T. Barber Highway. I had turned left onto Kentucky 435 and drove to my friend's house in Germantown. I picked him up and decided to go the same way that I had went to pick him up. There were three people in the back seat and someone in the front seat of my car. We had turned the car around, a right turn traveling around 20 miles per hour. As I turned the corner, there is a two-story farmhouse on my right and on the same side, about 30 feet to the side of the house, was a very small garden with tall weeds on the side of the road. On the other side is a drop anywhere from 10 to 15 feet. As I drove, I caught a glimpse of what appeared to be a large dog on the side of the road, so I slowed the car to let it run across the road without me hitting it. I turned on my brights to scare it from its position as I slowed to around 5 to 8 miles per hour. It moved slightly as someone in the back seat had asked, What is that? Then I replied, I think it might be a dog. The eyes glowed red from the high beams and moved a little to its right. The so-called dog had blackish fur on the shoulder area. As I pulled closer, I stopped the car, put it in reverse, and turned the car to face the animal. My light now fully caught the animal, still hiding in the weeds, which were around three feet in height. I pushed the horn, and it stood on two legs at a height of around six to seven feet tall. All of my friends then started screaming questions, asking, what the hell is that? As everyone in the car was screaming, I had already put the car into drive and peeled the tires to get away. One of my friends then turned in his seat, looking through the back window as I looked through the rear window mirror, seeing in the moonlight this animal run into the field toward the forest. The second encounter was on Clyde T. Barber Highway going southbound towards home. Me and my brother were making our way home from Aberdeen, Ohio. I was driving and it was a clear night with the moon out bright. I was driving around 55 to 60 miles per hour up the highway hill. I had just passed Kentucky 435 
and the same spot from the last encounter when I scanned the highway in a daze and looking up at the hill where they had used dynamite when they were building the highway to blow the hillside out for the pavement. I looked at the hillside at the limestone and caught a glimpse of a rather tall animal with blackish fur running with my car. I pointed at the beast, which apparently been running on two legs, and asked my brother, what is that? As we moved on still, watching the animal, it jumped from the hill and landed in some trees and disappeared. Jeremiah described the creature as being tall, around six and a half to seven feet. It stood and walked on two legs with arms reaching its pelvis. It had black fur and red eyes in the bright headlights. Large body, possibly three and a half feet wide, with stringy hair longer on the shoulders that looked like it was wet. Another Mason County creature sighting happened on August 16, 2008. Two Dover, Kentucky squirrel hunters were in the woods at 7.30 a.m. that morning when they heard a twig snap behind them. Thinking that it was a squirrel attempting to outflank them, they turned, and there he was. He was around 25 yards away. He acted as if he was looking for something. The witness, George A., claimed the creature was 8 feet tall, really muscular, and had a lot of hair. On to the next one. It was the summer, and having owned a salvage yard for over 13 years, Bob was accustomed to dealing with weird stuff. At the time, Bob was beset by a rash of teenagers sneaking into his business at night to steal parts and pull out radios from the vehicle. The thefts had become such a nuisance that Bob had hired a local police officer to serve as his nighttime security guard to help patrol the yard. Bob and his guard, Charlie, had devised a safety plan that if anyone was found breaking into the yard, Charlie would call Bob so the two men could confront the thieves together. At approximately 1.30 a.m., the duo would get a chance to put their plan into action as Charlie heard some loud rustling in the back of the salvage yard. Together, the two men cautiously walked to the back of the yard, sporting bright flashlights, hoping to scare off any intrepid intruders. As the two men crept toward the commotion, suddenly the silence of the night was shattered by a low-pitched scream that quickly morphed into a high-pitched scream. Bob gave the example of the scream sounding like the pitch of a police siren. It was right after the jolting scream that Bob first noticed a really strong, pungent odor in the air. Bob suddenly feared that something was not right. Instead of encountering enterprising trespassers, the men laid their eyes on something truly incredible, a gigantic monster lurking right in front of them. Charlie, acting on pure instinct, quickly pulled out his three fifty seven Magnum Smith and Wesson pistol and asked Bob if he should shoot the beast. Not sure what the unknown beast was capable of doing, Bob wisely urged him not to fire, fearing that the shot might only make the creature angry and cause it to launch an attack on them. Standing between eight to ten feet tall, the imposing creature was covered with extremely long hair that gave off a silvery reflection. Bob noted that the silvery hair had to be at least three or four inches long, and although the hair on the beast's upper torso appeared well-kept and groomed, the hair on its bottom half was all knotted and matted down and looked to be caked with dried mud. Bob and Charlie took extra note of the beast's unhuman-like shape and size. Bob estimated that its broad shoulders stretched over three and a half feet, and its unusually long arms almost dangled all the way down to its knees. As the creature's glowing red eyes blazed through the dark night, Bob could see the creature didn't have much of a neck leading up to its leathery face. Adding even more oddness to the creature was the fact that its peculiarly shaped head seemed to be slightly coned on the top. Then, as though the beast resorted to a defense mechanism, or perhaps serving as a deadly warning for the encroaching men, it quickly displayed its huge yellow teeth. The flabbergasted men stood frozen and watched as the beast stealthily darted in and out of sight. Even more troubling than its humongous stature 
was that for the entire time they spent watching it, the beast was continuously moving. While on the move, the monster seemed to be making weird grunting-like noises. Bob said it sounded more like clatter than simple grunt, almost as though the beast was busy talking or mumbling to itself. Not looking to stick around to find out the monster's intentions, Bob and Charlie started to make their way back to the safety of the garage, only to discover that the beast was slowly following them. Its silhouette could be spotted darting about in the darkness. Even more troubling to the men was that the beast's continuous ability to remain just outside of the reach of their flashlight, and when Bob cleverly attempted to lure it underneath a big motion-activated spotlight, the beast perhaps displaying some intelligence, made sure to avoid triggering any of the light. When the men finally reached the safety of the garage, after much debate, they decided not to report the sighting to the police, fearing they would never hear the end of the ridicule and ribbing. Instead, the guys called a few family members to come to their aid. Within a few minutes, the group consisted of Bob's mother, Irma, brother Ronnie, sister Joyce, wife Cherry, and 15-year-old son, Bobby, arrived on the scene. The family, thinking it was some sort of elaborate prank, jokingly showed up with the toilet paper for the overly scared witnesses. Irma told the Southern Illinoisian newspaper, we were going to tease him and say we were going to call the men in the white coat, but when we got there, we weren't so sure. It wouldn't take long before the skeptical family members became believers as well. As soon as they arrived, Irma picked up on the horrible smell wafting through the junkyard, noting that it smelled like a skunk fell in a sewer. For Joyce, it wasn't the first time she encountered that horrible smell. The previous night, she had noticed the same putrid smell wafting into her window, not far from the garage. With her senses burning from the odor, she heard the sound of something taking a large gulp from an outside dog bowl. She told the Southern Illinoisian that it was slurping like a person. Paralyzed with fear, she was unable to look outside to see what was helping itself to the dog's water. Now, barely 24 hours later, she once again found herself in another terrifying situation with the unknown. The perceived safety of the garage was short-lived, as the monster could still be heard lurking about outside in the darkness. A few seconds later, the group was startled by a loud bang on the door. The noise sounded as though something heavy was thrown up against the door. Soon, another blast came on the side of the building, followed by several others, each intensifying in sound. Bob believed that the creature was simply taunting the group by tossing rocks and boulders at them, as he firmly believed that the beast could have easily smashed through the door if it had wanted to. After a few moments of tense quietness, the group garnered the courage to slowly open the door and peek out into the darkness. With no monster in sight, the group hurriedly ran to their cars and rushed home. The next day, in an effort to establish some semblance of reality on the situation, Bob searched the area of the encounter and quickly discovered a gigantic footprint near the Missouri Pacific Railroad tracks that measured 14 inches in length and four inches in width. Several days later, two Bigfoot investigators made the journey from Michigan to Murfreesboro to lend assistance in finding the creature. Over time, everything began to calm down, and soon things around the scrapyard returned to normal. Eventually, Bob sold his business and moved away from Murfreesboro. But whatever it was that truly happened to Bob and Charlie that fateful night, it certainly made a lasting impression on them. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!